Black True Crime is a podcast that researches and discusses murders committed by Black offenders. It is a podcast that everyone and anyone is welcome to enjoy, but it's also a podcast that may not be welcomed by anyone and everyone. So listener discretion is advised. Now, without further ado, this is Black True Crime. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Kristen and I are on one today. <laughs> yeah, just... like just full of joy. Don't know where it came from. Must be oh the my Lord. Gosh. <laughs> okay, let's get into the episode. Just want to let you guys know, yes, the site will be up and running tomorrow. All you have to go to to um, ser- bleh, to shop our merch is blacktruecrime.com. And there's like a little tab that you can click that on and much. see and see what we got going on. I'm trying to add as many as I can by tomorrow, but I'm going to continue to add over the weekend. So stay tuned, guys. And they're so cute. Like, they're clothes okay. that I will wear on the daily. So oh, for sure. you know I'm about to put in an order. Same. Same. Okay, so let's get into this week's case. It is a doozy mm-hmm. in the sense of, like, it infuriated me because we do have footage and Ooh. audio of an interview that he did with someone and his demeanor was just god awful. So let's just traumatize ourselves starting now. The city of Cleveland has probably experienced more serial killers in a short amount of time than any other city in the United States. I'm speculating, but it might as well be true. There was Ariel Castro, the kidnapping rapist, and Anthony Powell, the serial strangling murderer who killed 11 women. Dang. Well, Kristen, this is the intro. Thank you. Well, the city of Cleveland produced another serial killer who kidnapped, raped, and murdered. Join us as we discuss a murderer named Michael Madison. Oh, my God. That just reminded me. I have come so far and not talking on the intros. That used to be my thing. I would talk on every single intro and look at me now. As you Minus just today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, today's an exception. Minus today. Minus today. We all <laughs> make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Michael Marilyn Manson Madison. I'm just kidding. Michael Madison was born on October 15th, 1990, 1977, somewhere in Pennsylvania. Kristen, what happened in black history in 1997. 1977. Fuck me. Right. Get it together. So, you guys, in 1977, for those of us who don't know and who weren't alive, president, the president of the United States at the time was Jimmy Carter. Um, mm-hmm. I don't have a lot of international news this time. It was very hard to find black history in other mm-hmm. countries because mm-hmm. it's like not as a big of a thing as in other yeah. countries as it is here in America. So I'm going to focus on America today, but trust and believe I got y'all. Um, I'm sure you got y'all. So one of the things that was happening in 1977, well, really, it started in the 1930s. Black mm. people were kind of being more interested in tracing their lineage, their family history. Now, nice. we know it's kind of been hard for some black people to trace their history because people aren't always taking records of who the slaves were, what their actual like surnames were. They were given the surnames of their master. So it's, it was, it's kind of hard to trace the family lineage, but we've been able to do what we can as, mm-hmm. um, I guess a government and a society. Mm-hmm. So. Starting in the 1930s, people were trying to trace their history. Now, in the 1970s, I believe. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Um, specifically in 1977, the last episode or the last we know it as a movie of Roots was created. Oh, shit. So for those of you guys who don't know about Roots, Roots is like, I think, like an eight movie tr- um thing the longest thing i've ever seen in my life (laughs) an eight movie collection about slavery following a guy whose name was kunta Kunta. who was taken from his village in africa sold into slavery and was soon named toby 
And they kind of like grew up the rest of his life um as a slave Ugh. and then he had children and got just, his foot cut off because he tried to escape if you want to be traumatized horribly watch roots it's a lot and honestly it's very educational so if you actually <laughs> want to learn about some stuff too that you never knew watch roots but also leave have, with some trauma because let's be real i mean our whole podcast is trauma so just understand you're gonna probably experience some trauma mm-hmm. um protect your space and your peace and things absolutely so yeah 1977 the last episode of roots was created and it was the largest production or the largest had the largest audience in the world at the time okay so basically a whole bunch of people watched the last episode of roots and fell in love with it it wasn't just an american thing the actual british um press got a hold of it and kind of started something that said literally help help America find their roots. It was actually oh, like a Lord. news page or a newsletter. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it was kind of cool because this was about black people. Like they were yeah. trying to help black people find mm-hmm. their family lineage, their roots. Yeah. I'll so, about to say, stay out of our business, UK. Just kidding. Just kidding. We be um, all up in y'all's. All the time. <laughs> so another thing that happened in 1977 President Jimmy Carter, he appointed Patricia Harris, which was the head of housing and urban development. She was the first, she became the first African-American woman to hold a cabinet position. Ooh. Shout out for Patricia. Go, girl. He also appointed Congressman Andrew Young to be the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. He was the first African-American to hold that post. Wow. Shout out to Senator Andrew Young. That yes, dope. indeed. That's all I got, guys. I love that. I also want to say that the creator of Roots it actually was a book first. And the creator of that book's name is Alex Haley. Alex Haley. Is that a black man? It's a black man. Nice. Well, thank you for that little trip down history lane that none of us probably knew. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. So back to Michael. When he was really young, like a baby, he and his mother moved to Cleveland, Ohio. Not much is known about Michael's dad because he didn't really know who he was. He actually never met him. His mother definitely tried to place someone in that father role for him, though, because he says that he had at least 14, quote, transient parental figures. Emphasis on the transient because they would not stay around for fucking long. Basically, all we're saying is mama was a rolling stone. Okay, she did what she wanted to do. Uh, Wherever she laid her purse was her home. That's kind of like the situation that she was in. And because she moved around so much and she was, like we said, a rolling stone, she left her kids a lot. They would go and live with relatives. She at one point actually lost custody of... um. I know at le- she at least lost custody of Michael, but I'm not sure about his half brother named J.R. Miller. I don't know if she lost custody of him too. In 1993, the two of them went to stay with their uncle back in Pennsylvania for a while. And the environment that the uncle had those two boys in was probably the worst environment they could have been in at that time because Michael was maybe like 15 years old. And I don't know if his uncle was like, hey, he's a grown man, but his uncle felt comfortable enough to have sex with women in front of him, like as he's sitting next to them. And he even, yeah, and he even encouraged both boys to use drugs and watch porn. Wow. Disgusting. I don't know if JR, I was about to say, you're doing a great job. I don't know if JR was the younger brother or something like that, but- That'll come up a little bit later. Michael would later claim to a doctor that he'd never been sexually abused himself. Although an aunt did come forward and say that he was sexually abused by a babysitter when he was six years old. So that's really, really sad. And that's an age that he probably just didn't like remember it and just blocked it out. Mm -hmm. But Michael did claim that he'd seen his brother J.R. being sexually abused by their uncle. Oh, no. The one that they were living with. Um, which was just probably just as bad as honestly having it done himself to himself, you know, watching your little brother or your big or whoever, your family member being hurt like that is beyond traumatizing. Absolutely. 
And it's like, so if you feel responsible for your younger brother, assuming he is, right, then that's going to traumatize you probably even more than someone doing that to you, to your, to yourself, because you're supposed yeah. to protect that. Oh person. yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Michael claims that his first sexual experience happened when he was just 15 years old. And remember, at 15, he was living with that disgusting uncle. So it probably happened while he was there. And it happened with a 35-year-old woman. Dang. Wow. Horrible. Oh, my God. Krista, remember how Boosie was, like, bragging about getting his kid, like, a his kid was turning, like, 13 or something like that. And he was like, oh, I'm going to get him a blowjob. Mm-hmm. Like, what? Mm-hmm. Oh, as if that's like some rite of passage that all like it's something that have. or something that you should be posting like who are you really about to pay to get your son you know to suck your son off this is a child like that's disgusting okay yeah now like <laughs> that i see because i loved boosie but now i'm like sir like you need to get your shit together and like he really be coming for gay people like i need you to sit down mm-hmm. so anyway so we know that michael would live with his mom on and off and that when he was with her, he fucking hated it. He said she was extremely abusive. He claimed that she'd beaten him with a cord, punched him in the eye, forcibly stuffed food down his throat, bathed him with burning hot water, and inflicted extreme punishments like forcing him to do a bunch of push-ups for like until he couldn't do any more type of thing. He also says she once choked him until he passed out. Okay, so what was her problem? Well, what do I'm sorry. Is this about Diane Madison? No. <laughs> I don't like, fucking know what her, her issue though. was. Right. But she's she's in and out of their lives and then when she comes back, she's inflicting pain. Like what's right. your issue? Yeah, like what have who hurt you? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, she was oh. beautiful. <laughs> she was younger. <laughs> she was a pretty woman. She was just sort of evil (laughs) even her boyfriends were allowed to physically abuse michael he said no he said on one occasion he was taken to the hospital after one of his boy or his mother's boyfriends had beat his ass so bad wow yeah and these beatings caused him to have severe head trauma at a young age which is like yeah you know if you're getting beat like come on bro which we all know by now probably causes, no, definitely causes, um, you know, effects and decreased ability to develop, you know, and, and mentally mature and all that good stuff. Especially since when a child is, is a child, that's yes. the most imperative time for their brain to grow and learn things. So if you impair the brain while it is in its adolescent or younger years, it's going to impact them in the long term. I mean, and probably, and, Probably every single way. Absolutely. Poor guy. Poor guy. Poor kid, you know? He was a kid. Yeah. His mother also failed to feed him enough. She didn't help him with homework. She didn't spend time with him, like, taking to playgrounds and movies and stuff like that. She didn't even get him Christmas presents. And she rarely ever told him she loved him. Now, what I read, it said that she never told him. But I'm like, it's really hard to believe that a mother never, ever told her child that she loved him. Mm -hmm. But it could be true. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to say something so absolute, you know, and it not be true. Mm -hmm. Michael did grow up and have two children of his own, which by all accounts were really loved by their father. So he really like did what he could to be a good dad to them. I couldn't find any information about Michael after he was 15. I'm not sure if he like graduated high school or anything like that. I just know that by 2001, at 24 years old, he was a convicted drug dealer. Mm. Mm -hmm. So he was out here making his coin on the the streets of East Cleveland. Was this before or after he had kids? This was during. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So he has children at this point. Yes. Okay. And that's not all he was doing. In October of 2001, Michael dragged an 18-year-old woman down an East Cleveland street where he threw her behind a house and was like preparing to rape her. Luckily, a police officer just happened to pull up a few minutes later and Michael just like took off running. The very 
probably the one to three times a police officer actually comes on time. <laughs> one in three? You're giving them a lot. <laughs> I'm just saying. Like, I have to give them something at this mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Thank God that they were there before a crime actually happened. <laughs> Yes, I was so happy when I read that. I was like, yes, 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 Lord. So yeah, Michael ran off, but police were able to arrest him. He was charged with attempted rape. He pled guilty and was sentenced to only four years in prison. Hmm. So I guess it's like, it doesn't count if you tried and didn't succeed. Oh my God. So before being released from prison, he was required to undergo treatment for sex offenders, which at the time was basically like a one-time program inmates would just have to complete. I don't know. It's probably like, do you still have these urges? No. Okay, you're good. Like, I don't mm-hmm. even know what the fuck that would entail. According to Wesley Jennings, a criminology professor at the University of South Florida. Period. Go fucking Bulls. alumni. There needs to be, quote, there needs to be a follow-up in the community. It is similar to drug offenders. A one-time program is not a pan, pan, panacea, panacea. Hmm? Yeah. So it's spelled P-A-N-A-C-E-A, and I looked it up. It means a solution or remedy for all difficulties or diseases. Okay. People have to be so extra with these words. Oh he was, comp- I, I was like, I, am I saying like panoramic or like, what, Pangea? That's what I thought. I was like, Pangea? (laughs) I don't know. Hmm. Anyway. (laughs) He completed the program and was required to register as a sex offender when he was released, which he did. He just listed his mother's address in Cleveland instead of the shitty ass apartment in East Cleveland that he was actually living at. So he's just like fucking the system up and down. He's dodging. Yeah, he's a sketchy ass nigga. Sorry. Well, hey, <laughs> I can I can't tell you what he was doing from 2005 to 2003, but I can almost promise you it wasn't fucking good. I know he was still selling drugs and was probably in and out of jail for charges related to his prof- this profession. Either way, whatever he was doing, hopefully wasn't as horrific and violating as what he would do next. Mm. In July 2013, Michael was living in a second floor apartment on Hayden Avenue in East Cleveland. On the ground floor of the building was a cable company. And one day in July, some of those cable company workers had noticed a horrible smell Mm -hmm. coming from a garage behind the building. And they decided to call police. The garage was used by several people at the time, including Michael. So when police found a large bag jammed in between Michael's car and the wall, They kind of was like, it really could be anybody's. Who knows what this is? But when they cut open the bag, they found the body of 18-year-old Sherelda Terry. Her body had been wrapped in a paisley pattern bed sheet and put into multiple trash bags. No. Officers continued to search the area and found another trash bag under a brush pile behind the garage and in that bag was the decomposing body of 28 year old shatisha shealy wow police made one more gruesome discovery at an abandoned house about 20 yards away from the bush pile and in the basement of that house was a big trash bag that held the body of 38 year old angela deskins i may not be saying that right but angela She was wrapped and put into multiple trash bags like the other two women. But instead of the paisley pattern sheet, Angela was wrapped in a sports-themed blanket. Wow. Autopsies on both Sherelda and Angela found that they'd both been strangled to death with a belt. Sherelda had a severe laceration penetrating her vagina and anus that was not a post-mortem wound, meaning this was done to her while she was still alive oh god come on that poor lady shatisha was found with a deep bruise on her face again an anti-mortem wound means you know before she died but everything else on her body was too badly decomposed for the examiner to identify a specific cause of death but they were able to rule that she died from homicide Mm. all three of the women had been bent at the waist with their heads bound to their legs so like the visual right there that's enough for me 
the disrespect that's from the visual is enough for me when it comes to the circumstances of their deaths all three women had gone missing within the past year. So 28-year-old Shatisha hadn't talked to her family since September 2012. Her mother reported her missing after Shatisha didn't even attend her own brother's funeral in October. And I'm sorry, in December 2012. Um, that same month he was shot and killed. Wow. So she didn't show up. Her mom's like, okay, something's really, really going on. Mm-hmm. Later on at, spoiler alert, the trial... One of Michael's past girlfriends named Brittany Darby claimed that she remembered seeing a fresh scab on his nose around that time. She said she asked, she said when she asked him about it, he told her that he was trying to break up a fight between two girls and somehow one of the girls like swung on him and he was injured. Mm. Okay, sir. 38 year old Angela hadn't been in contact with her family since May 2013. According to her family and one of her friends at trial testified that around that time, he had dropped Angela off at an abandoned barbecue spot in East Cleveland, where she was scheduled to meet Michael that that evening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Around that same time, Brittany said that she started to notice a strong, disgusting smell in Michael's apartment. And when she confronted him about it, he said, oh, there's like two dead raccoons in the front closet. In the closet. Why are they in the closet? Where do you even get two raccoons for them to be dead in your closet? Like, let's just say they were in the walls. Why would you keep them in your closet? Were you going to dispose of them later? Are you stupid? Yes. There's a lot of questions that Brittany should have continued to ask. But I digress. (laughs) (laughs) Because something's not right here. Right. She said she started to inquire further about the raccoons and Michael started sweating and getting nervous. Mm -mm. She asked him to show her the raccoons and he said, quote, you don't want to see that. It's gross. And he like put his hand on her shoulder like, no, babe, I want to like protect you from that. If you wanted to protect me, why did you keep two dead raccoons in the house? (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. if that's even if the raccoons are really in there, you know. Which we know. Which we know. <laughs> right. We know it's not. And she knew. Mm-hmm. Deep down. Deep down. Later in the week, the smell was still there. But apparently the raccoons weren't. When she asked about the raccoons again, Michael got annoyed with her and responded with irritation. <laughs> and he's like, I told you the day raccoons was in there. Like, are you going to fucking let it go or what? <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... So we're just going to deal with foolishness. That's what yes, we're going to do. Yes, absolutely. An 18-year-old 18, an 18 Sheraldo was last seen alive on July 10th, 2013, leaving a Cleveland elementary school where she had a part-time summer job. Wow. Apparently, she'd been, she met Michael a week before her disappearance, and they exchanged numbers. They started texting back and forth for the next couple days, trying to get to know each other, except he was telling Sherelda all lies, obviously. Mm. He told her that he was 25 with no kids, when in reality, he was 35 with two. And he also lied about his o- occupation. It's just like, okay, if I was a drug dealer, I'd lie too. But I'm looking at him like, mm, you ain't 25. <laughs> sure. People need but to she- ask more questions. But she's 18, like she's a baby. She probably is just like, oh, okay, you know. And we'll learn more about her later. She was very Mm -hmm. innocent and just beautiful. She looks it. In their text messages, they talked about meeting up to hang out. Michael suggested that Sherelda come to his house. And she replied, quote, we can hang out, but I'm not going to your house. I don't trust you. Period. End quote. Period. Sorry, I said something while you were talking. No, you're fine, bitch, because what you said was necessary. Period. I would have did the exact same thing, and I hope she was rolling her neck when she typed it. I know, but what did she say at the end? Because I didn't hear it. (laughs) (laughs) She said, I don't trust you yet. Period. Sheralda. My girl. Yup. With this wig on. My girl. Kristen, matter of fact, (laughs) give me the wig. (laughs) Which wig is it? Because I want it. I just love her. (laughs) She's adorable. Adorable. On the afternoon of July 10th, Sherelda texted Michael and said, quote, do you want to hang out now? End quote. And Michael replied, yes. 
I'm assuming he said that and asked her if she was headed to his street to which she replied, quote, I'm on 152nd and St. Clair right now. That will be her last text message that she ever sent. So he probably like pulled up on her, like behind her, like pulled her in a car or something. Just an evil, evil man. He probably a was couple like, day- hey, I, you know, met her there and was like, come on in. Let's go somewhere. No. A couple days later, Brittany noticed a long, deep scratch on Michael's shoulder. When she applied pressure about what the fuck happened, he said that he had been in a fight and that the guy he was fighting had a girlfriend and she was there and had scratched him. Do you see like this pattern developing of him blaming everyone and anything else? Well, I'm sorry. Every other woman. Thank you. That he could. Right. Like with the first cat fight. First of all, you need to stay out of women's business. Because mm, I'm sure that mm. had nothing to do with you. <laughs> if, quote, unquote, you were if it happened, which we know, fight. which we know. Right. Stay out of women's business. <laughs> and then <laughs> now the guy you were fighting had a girlfriend. Like you, you clearly have an issue with women, sir. <laughs> it's abundantly clear. Mm hmm. Michael had another girlfriend named Shantae Mahone, who also claimed to notice a terrible smell in his apartment. He told her he didn't know what that smell was and that it might be a dead animal. He didn't know. And around that same time, Shantae said that she saw several deep scratches on Madison's face, or Madison, that's his last name, on Michael's face, which he explained away saying, quote, he got into a fight and a girl jumped in and scratched his face. So at least he's consistent with his bullshit. Consistency is key. <laughs> I feel like they would be like, because if he tried to blame it on a man, they would look at him like, what man is out here scratching? Scratching you, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't clear exactly what evidence the police used as probable cause for issuing an arrest warrant. Maybe it was like his past. Maybe it was the close proximity the bodies were to where he lived. Uh, maybe it was the text messages. I don't actually know. But he was arrested on July 19th. Only nine days after Sherelda's murder. Wow. So like when I heard that, I was really, really happy because I was yeah. like, they're not dragging their feet, you know, like they're using the evidence that they have and they they found their suspect. Right. Even though for Angela Desk and, and Shatisha, they had to wait a little longer. Well, yeah. Ugh. Yeah, that's sad. <sighs> so he bef- before he allowed police to take him into custody, he engaged in a two hour police standoff at his mother's house. So wow. <laughs> please look at the pictures of him and stuff to kind of yeah. get an idea. Like it's hard to talk about you're talking about somebody and not having the image of them in your head is difficult. But just seeing him, he just seems like a fucking loser. Like he genuinely seems like a loser, dusty. Apparently he was a type of drug drug addict that I mean drug dealer that used his own supply. So he was on drugs heavily too. And then you at your mama's house, the same Oops. one who put her hands on you, the mm-hmm. same one who let men abuse you. Here mm-hmm. you go, hunt, like hiding up under her arms mm-hmm. as if now she's going to protect you. She never protected you. Why would she protect mm-hmm. you now? I agree. Well, you know, it, it comes. It's like, oh, you know how some people will say no one could talk to my friend like that. or No one can beat up my bitch. You know, except for me, like <laughs> that may be the type of situation that that was, you know, But I think it also shows like he probably always wanted his mom to love him, to protect him. And he still has that. I want my mommy vibe, even though his mommy would throw hands with him. Like yeah. that sounds extremely familiar. 28 year old Shatisha Sheely was a mother to a daughter named Angel. Mm. She was known to be struggling at the time at that time in her life when she passed away. She was unemployed, living in an apartment, just trying to figure out like what she was going to do with her life. I couldn't find any positive, uplifting like things about her, which is really confusing for me. Usually victims are talked about in like a good light. The only positive thing that I could say was like she lived her life on the edge. But all the other news I found talked about how she'd been arrested in June on June 30th, 2012 for firing a weapon. But the case was dropped because there was no witnesses. Hmm. Her bond was only a thousand dollars at the time, but she had no one to help her pay it. So she just had to stay in jail for three months until her um, conviction was dismissed or her. I'm sorry. The case was dismissed. 
18-year-old Sherelda Terry was very active in her church. She would like go to Bible study all the time. She was actually credited with starting a praise dance ministry Period. at Antioch Christian Fellowship Church. Her mother was a reverend and said that if you looked at her Facebook page, she was always sharing a word of encouragement and usually a scripture from the Bible. She was also homeschooled until the fourth grade, and she was said to be an avid hugger. <laughs> an avid hugger! So much so that her grandma said she was going to have to put her on a hug diet. <laughs> <laughs> How isn't cute that, is that? Isn't that so wholesome? So cute. 38-year-old Angela Deskin, fam her family said that she was a very trusting person and that even though life wasn't too kind to her at that time, she always had a place to lay her head because her family just really loved her. She had like a brother or sister. Um, her parents were still alive. They just mm -hmm. looked out for her. Rest in peace to those women. Absolutely. It doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. You, there's No one has the right to take it from you, period. Absolutely not. So rest in peace. All right, peace. So the shit bag Michael was interrogated by detectives over a period of days. And on July 21st, 2013, based on my birthday. <laughs> where was I at July 21st? I was in Tampa at a club called Piranha in Ybor City getting hammered. <laughs> Wasted. Is that illegal to say? <laughs> Is that illegal to say? No. <laughs> okay, back to this. July 21st, 2013, Michael signed a four-page confession admitting to a few things. Well, yeah. let's get into it. He admitted to choking a woman to death in October 2012, which I think was um, Shatisha, mm. and then leaving her in his apartment while he went out drinking. I remember his birthday's in October, so this was probably around like his birthday. He's like, oh, let me give myself a present and take a life. Just wow. disgusting. Give and take in the same sentence. I hate him. Isn't it? Oh, disgusting. He said when he came back, he, quote, folded her up, but put her in the trash bags and moved her body to the garage. He said he kept it there for months and then moved it to behind the garage. It's like, and know. you're a procrastinator, like... <sighs> and you're a sloppy, you're a sloppy killer. Those Lazy are the fucking killer. worst. Pissed like, how off. can you lazy killer? That's perfect. However, Michael claims that he had no memory of killing anyone else. In regards to 18 year old Sherelda, he said, quote, he was really drunk and high that night and did not remember killing her, but that he did remember waking up to her dead body and later putting it in the, you know, garage with the garbage bags and all that stuff. And in regards to Angela, Michael said he didn't remember anything about her death or disposing of her body. So depending on what drug he could be on, this could be true. Like he may not remember the actual acts. It's possible. But I think it's very fucking unlikely. I was going to say specifically for Sherelda, because like if he picked her up, right, or however he got to her, let's say yeah. he was driving or walking, whatever, and mm -hmm. she's a basically a beautiful bible thumper i wonder if she like saw that he was intoxicated or could sense that he was already on something before he mm -hmm. got her because when would he have time to all of a sudden smoke and drink and get so high where you don't remember things while she was there yeah. knowing that this is a woman who probably loves the lord and maybe that type of environment made her at least uncomfortable yeah Mind you, yeah. I love the Lord and I've smoked weed. So I'm not saying that those two <laughs> things don't go together. They absolutely do. But what I'm saying is she seemed like the type that would be uncomfortable being around a man who is intoxicated or who is doing drugs. Right, right. I don't know so what the circumstances of her, of him picking her, her up were. Right. But I really would love to know because she seemed like someone that had a really good head on her shoulders yeah. and he just may be a m master manipulator. Like who knows? Absolutely. And then at 18, to be honest, if the right man with, you know, the right amount of hairline left and um, supple lips gave me a compliment, I probably would be ready to risk some things. Like, you know, you're young. You're stupid. <laughs> you say, hey, let's, you only live, live one a little type life. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. 
I wasn't able to find out when Michael said this, but he apparently said that he was kind of influenced by a local, by a local serial killer. So two years prior, Anthony Sowell, or Soul, whatever, was sentenced to death for the murders of 11 women. Remember, I mentioned him in the intro. And he was known as the Cleveland Strangler. And he had a tendency to hide bodies in his home and like his immediate area as well. Just just horrible. So that's what you choose to be your role model. <laughs> that's a who you're looking player. at. It's just sad. And and Issues. part of me wants to really cover that case, Anthony Sal. I love to say He's black. You know, we could yeah. do that. If you guys want us to cover that, let us know. Yeah, definitely. Ariel Castro was also arrested in 2013. It was I think it was like maybe four months before his no, it was in March. So it was three months before his arrest. Mm. Kristen, how many four months, whatever the fuck. And he was arrested only ten miles from where Sherelda, Shatisha, and Angela were found. Mm. If you don't know about Ariel, he kidnapped three women when they were like kids and kept them for over 10 years. He was just raping them and doing horrible things until one was able to escape, thankfully, and get help for them. To me, it's like, do these killers just like go on a dark website where they just talk to each other and share their secrets and say, Sometimes. hey, I kind of like that MO. Let me like adopt that. I feel like they do. And I feel like they were on that dark website before they started killing. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Looking for like minded individuals. Exactly. When police went and searched Michael's apartment, they found a few personal items that had Sherelda's DNA on it. Mm -hmm. A piece of bloodstained carpet that was found in the closet with a DNA profile consistent with Angela's. And it's the same, uh, that same closet that Brittany said that she smelled that horrible smell in. And they also found a pillowcase in the apartment with paisley patterned fabric matching the pattern print on the sheets that Sherelda was wrapped in. So he's just like, oh, you need evidence? Here Rack it, it up. is. Rack Take it up. Take it. Rack I'll it up. I'll put it in a bow for you. <laughs> and serve it on a platter. And serve it in a platter. So with this evidence, this this a little bit so with this evidence the signed confession and probably like witness statements and all that type of stuff michael was charged with three counts of aggravated murder three counts of kidnapping one count of rape th and three counts of abuse of corpse mm -hmm. because oh yeah not only was he violating them in life he violated them in death too and had his way with their bodies after he'd already killed them so mm -hmm. i'm like disgusted like mm -hmm. i was already disgusted with him but it takes a certain type of animal to defile yeah. a dead body yep yep and he is an animal <sighs> the worst kind it's an insult to animals actually actually it is yes because i have one and she's amazing she's incredible and she would, and she never, would do never do this like <laughs> The death penalty wasn't initially included in the indictment, but the prosecution was reserving the right to add it later. Surprisingly, he was given a bail after killing three women, but it was set at six million dollars. So we already okay. know his. I was going to say of how much he, he wasn't getting out. No. And he also waived his right to a preliminary hearing. When his case was brought before a grand jury, they returned a 14 count indictment against Michael. So we already listed off 10 of them, I believe. And then he was charged for like misuse of a weapon and stuff like, like that. Mm -hmm. So you guys know me. I'm really interested in how the defense plans to even defend a piece of shit like this. So in this case, the defense decided to focus on his horrible childhood and the long term effects it had on his life. The defense called a man named Dr. something Cunningham to the stand. He evaluated Michael and concluded that Michael is fundamentally impaired in his ability to understand the emotional experiences of others, which just sounds like a sociopath to me, honestly. Right. Or someone who's just not compassionate. D yeah. He said that he believes that Michael has choices and is capable of making them, but that he lacks the same foundation for making choices that quote, less damaged people have. Hmm. So, yeah, basically, he's saying everyone has terrible experiences and his have made him unable to make sound choices. 
okay. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like okay, okay. Like I'm picking up what you're putting down. I just may not hold it for too long. But at the same time, is it supposed to excuse murder? Right, right, right. That's what I'm like. Mm, I'm I'm on this roller coaster with you, but I might fling myself off. I'm hanging off. <laughs> According to Dr. Cunningham, it is very unusual for someone with a history like Michael to lead a quote highly achieving constructive life. But he also admitted that there are people that have horrible childhoods and still have been able to be highly successful and functioning and, you know, members of society. That so he's like, it's he's he's like, it's possible. Right. You know, but it's also whatever. not common. Right. The prosecution called a Dr. Pitt to the stand to rebut. Dr. Pitt diagnosed Michael as having antisocial personality disorder, which is a condition defined by a pervasive pattern of violating the rights of others. So just like class A asshole. Dr. Pitt also saw evidence that Michael has a, quote, victimization mindset, a.k.a. he just tends to see himself as a victim. Everyone else has done him wrong. Very common. Mm hmm. Unlike Dr. Cunningham, Dr. Pitt found no evidence that Michael has a mental disease or defect. Dr. Pitt emphatically disagreed with Dr. Cunningham's conclusion that Michael's history, quote, limited the range of choices or options that were available to him, end quote. He found Michael, quote, entirely capable of making lawful choices. So it's like, yes, stop using your your terrible experiences as an excuse. Because at the end of the day, everybody has terrible experiences. Mm-hmm. It's how you decide to respond after you've had them that make you yeah. a moral or immoral person. Correct. Everybody meets that road. Correct. In layman's terms, Dr. Pitt's opinion was that Michael's childhood did not cause him to commit the murders and that he rejected the idea that Michael's ability to make choices in life was limited by his background. So he's like, take responsibility for your actions, sir. You know, you can blame no one else. You're a grown ass man, which is fair. Right. But we've also seen that people's experiences in their past have led mm-hmm. them to make crappy decisions because this is what I've known. So I'm going yeah. to continue to do what I've known. Absolutely. Like we, we get it. It's just like, you have to take responsibility for some point, you know, at Either some way. point. Because yeah. we're all in the same society, in a sense. Yeah, your experience in society may be different, but we're all kind of exposed to right or wrong. And you know? if we were to be able to blame our decisions on our parents and how they raised us, and that's our way of getting out of that, then nobody yeah. would be held accountable for anything. For and anything. all of our parents <laughs> would be in prison. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Or at least should be. Right. His ex-girlfriend also testified. Remember, we already talked about her a little bit. Mm-hmm. Among the other testimony that she gave, she also said that, quote, I told him I was going to move to Columbus with my friend. He said he didn't care. Everybody leaves him anyway. I told him I love him and I care and stuff. And he just sat there and went to sleep, end quote. Another like, oh, woe is me. Everyone does me wrong moment for him. I don't give a fuck. And shortly before Michael was arrested, he asked her, quote, if something happens to me, would you be there? End quote. She told him, sure. And Mm -hmm. he said, I'll call you right back. She said the next call he made to her included a semi confession. Mm -hmm. Semi. She said, quote, I said, what's wrong? And he said, quote, they found a body next to my car in the garage. And I paused and I said, they think you did it. End quote. Yeah, bitch, they think he did it. Like she said, it's next to his garage. <laughs> I mean, he's in his garage next to his car. His Granted, car. Everybody used that dog on garage. A- at the very least, he's a suspect. Like at the right. very least, she said he denied having anything to do with the body, but said that she could, but said that she could have all of his belongings. <laughs> so like he's going somewhere, and he knows, he knows it. it. I didn't do this, but just in case, here is everything I treasure. Hmm. Because I'm never going to see it again. She became emotional when she was shown the bloodstained materials from Michael's apartment and said that she remembered seeing them there. Ugh. Yeah, but she ain't say shit. That's what I'm saying. You saw it, but you didn't say nothing. The jury found Michael guilty of all charges and they recommended the death sentence for each murder charge. Ooh. 
Yeah, so somebody out there is happy. When Naturally, he, the victim get the death death sentence. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> I already know what she's gonna say. We'll get to it. <laughs> Naturally, the victims' families were really happy, and they felt like they got justice. So that's good. And speaking of victims' families, watch this video of Sherelda's father at Michael's sentencing, throwing himself over the defense table in an attempt to get his hands around Michael's neck. Period. You I may have, have seen it any other way. <laughs> you may have seen this um, video clip before, probably on YouTube or just something like that. It's kind of famous. But yes, this is the whole backstory behind it. That is Sherelda's father. And yeah, go ahead and take a look at it. If you're on Patreon, you're already on the ball. If you're not, what are you doing? But mm-hmm. I may still post it on IG for you guys. So we'll see. What a father. He looked right. at that man and said, I want nothing but blood and <laughs> dove. <laughs> I mean, flew. And he attacked him because Michael was apparently smiling at him. Like as he was describing how hurt he was, you know, about for the loss of their daughter and stuff. And he was smiling at him. So like, can you imagine he how he it. felt? Absolutely. Goodness gracious. So wow. yeah, that was that was a moving moment. I was like, get him, get him. Literally I was like hoping. I was hoping and praying he could just snatch him up really quick, at least punch him in the jaw or something. Like, are you gonna keep my battle cry in there? Cause I'm like, go get him. I might if I can tone it down. Cause you screamed <laughs> in the microphone. <laughs> I feel like I literally screamed so loud that my audio like cut it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope I hope it did. <laughs> oh god so that was of course yeah that was definitely pain for sure that was pain man Mm -hmm. so of course there has to be appeals to waste everyone's time and since there wasn't much to appeal in my opinion michael's lawyers decided to find any and everything they could wrong with the jury so they Mm -hmm. felt that Number one, they felt that counsel was not allowed to ask the proper questions during voir dire. Oh, Jesus. So it's, (laughs) it's, I can't pronounce it, Lord knows, but it's basically the preliminary examination phase of jurors to determine whether a prospective juror has the statutory qualifications to be a juror and is free from bias or prejudice. So it's basically Mm -hmm. a jury screening. Mm -hmm. And, the prosecution and the defense are allowed to ask questions. They felt like they weren't allowed to ask the as many or the right ones, whatever the fuck. They also complained that the trial court allowed the prosecution to ask the pro- prospective jurors whether they would, quote, follow the law despite their personal views and use the responses to retain jurors who should have been excluded. So let me explain that a little bit. So basically, they were kind of using wordplay. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to the death penalty, which we we know that Ohio is a state that does the death penalty, um, they're basically saying that the prosecution said, hey, because the death penalty is legal here and because he meets or this case meets that burden of proof for the death penalty, will you guys follow the law and issue that death penalty? Even mm. though they have, yes, even though they have the choice of giving him, you know, life without parole. Don't do that. So, so they are basically saying like, mm, bitch, like I see what you're trying to do. Which some salesmen actually take on this tactic because it's it's very good. You ask the question that you want the specific answer to. It's so. very manipulative. Oh, for sure. But that's what lawyers do. They want, they want to lie, manipulate whatever they can to get their client off. And 
Apparently it kind of worked, but even though this is the prosecution, the prosecution's like, look, bitch, we can play dirty too. Michael's appeal was denied and he is currently sitting on death row at the Chillicothe Correctional Institution in Ross County, Ohio. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he still has some appeals that he can, um, that he's in the process of filing. So he's not done with that process. I think at the very least, they'll probably knock him down to life, you know, without parole. Mm -hmm. But we'll see. He did an interview with Phil Chalmers. Remember our guy from the Terry Blair um, episode? He did an interview with him. And I have a couple clips that I want to share with you guys. So first, he talks about his relationship growing up with his mom. So listen to this. You know, we grew up, you know, saying getting ass whooped or whatever. But, you know, that it was particular times, you know, when I got older where, you know, I don't know, looking back on it, she was more of a bully. It wasn't it wasn't like parents and it was like she was a bully. Because then once we got to a certain size, she just took on different tactics. But looking back on it, it was it seemed to always be about tearing down, you know, self-pride. And, you know, if you had like any type of confidence or you building up confidence or, you know, self-esteem, it was shit like that that, you know, kind of, you know, like, Oh, tearing down shit like that. That was, that was, that was, that was worse. That was worse than the ass whoopers. Oh, I mean, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, a lot of things that went into it. A lot of things that went into it. Like different times, at different times I get, you know, I had different aspects, but like I say, it's, it's a lot that went into it. Cause it's like, you know, you got, you got, you got those who, you know, was in foster homes or whatever. Or people, like I even thought of that, like if, if like when the state took me away from her mm-hmm. and they'd have never gave me back, you know, it's not no guarantee that things would have been better for me for it. But at the same time, I feel like I probably would have had a better chance of making it because you're not getting, like in a foster home, you're not getting tore down mm-hmm. by somebody that you that you love and, you know, somebody that you, that, you know, you, you your mother, that she she mean the world to you, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And I never even, you know, met my father, so I didn't, I didn't really look to any male or, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't look to any male as a role model, I didn't look up to any male or nothing, so it was just her. I get it. I get it. Your mom was a piece of crap. Um, <laughs> long, but- long story. But on the other hand, it's also like a slap to the face to the people who've had piece of crap moms and dads or a lack thereof and have still mm-hmm. made it and still done amazing things in this world. Like you're yeah. basically telling them like, like life couldn't have been have that bad been, for you. You yeah. shouldn't have never been shit because yeah. I ain't shit because my mom and dad <laughs> treated me horrible. So right. you shouldn't have been sh- either. But it's all about the choices you make afterwards. So piss off. Right, right, right. And then Phil asked him about that time in court when Sherelda's dad tried to attack him. Phil asked Michael what he thought about that whole situation, and this is what he had to say. Funny? No, funny. Hilarious. Because he was, uh, he had this, like, this, I guess you want to call it a meme mug on his face, and, and he just looked funny to me. I don't force, I don't force a, uh, like, humor. Or me laughing is never forced. I only laugh at shit that's funny. There's plenty of times when I was sitting there, any, it was times when anybody could have came and jumped over the table, but he chose to wait until I was shackled and handcuffed to, you know, to, to pull the stunt. So, yeah, I'm, you know, fucking hilarious. Like, how fucking dare you? That's how I you- wish he got Ugh. his hands on you, talking about you thought it was funny. I don't laugh at anything forced. I laugh at, I laugh at things that are really funny. That Nobody funny. freaking acts. Like, duh. Why would you right. laugh at something that you didn't think was funny, you fucking loser? But that just but- shows, like, he has no remorse. Don't None. even ask a question if you're remorseful, because we all see it's a... No, he's not. Kristen, there is no remorse in this man's fucking body. And it's for him to be so 
hung up on how he was treated when he was younger and da 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 da. I never understand how people can be treated wrong by one person and then use it as an excuse to treat everybody else wrong. Like that, I feel like is the worst type of person. It really, really is. And he is definitely fucking one of them and showing his true colors, even after being in jail for what, six years, seven years at that point. And he didn't even acknowledge the fact that it's like, yeah, I understand why the dad tried to literally knock my brains out because I killed his daughter. He was just like, well, you waited until I was shackled to do something. Chris, are you serious? He essentially pulled his dick out in court. Like he's like, oh, you know, you're not about to challenge the size of my penis because you want to attack me because I'm being hella disrespectful. It's like, do you even remember why you're here? Right. (laughs) Don't even get me chow when I saw that. I was like, wow, this is hella disgusting. And then I ha- honestly, I had to edit out Phil Chalmers actually like chuckling with this man. Like after he said it was fucking hilarious at the end, there was like a chuckle from Phil. I was like, well, Phil, like I get that you interview these people, but don't, don't, you know, take it a step f- further and be disrespectful. You know, I hope it was a chuckle shit. of disgust. Bitch, like you, <laughs> look you at be fooling guy. me. You could have fooled me. And if you but guys you know want to see the full, if you guys want to see the full video, just go to YouTube, type in Phil Chalmers, um, Michael Madison interview, and it'll pop up. Mm-mm-mm. Now, one more clip I want to share. He was asked about unsolved cases. So Phil asked him, hey, what about some of the unsolved murders that you may have done or, you know, whatever? And in regards to those cases, what he thinks. And this is what he had to say. Oh, no. Everything, anything that they ain't get me for, that should have, that should have died with me. Duh. <laughs> like, we can tell what type of person you are. You're yeah, not we helpful. can already tell. No, no, no. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not even like he's, like, reveling in this. It's not like he did this for attention. Mm-mm. He did it to do it. And then because now he probably he's... really enjoyed it. Let's be right. real. But he's not enjoying the whole, um you know, getting caught part. (laughs) And in other extremely shocking, horrible news, in June 2019, Michael's mother, 62-year-old Diane Madison, was stabbed to death in her own home. Mm -hmm. The same home that Michael was arrested at in 2013. Yeah. There were three children there with her at the time, unfortunately, and they were attacked and stabbed also, but they were only injured. They didn't die. Who Thank did the it? Lord. It happened around 1215 a.m. An 18-year-old Jalen Plummer broke into the house, stabbed Diane to death, and then attacked the 12-year-old boy and the two 10-year-old girls that were there while they were sleeping. One of the girls, thankfully, was able to escape to a neighbor's house to get help. But by the time help arrived, Diane was already dead and she was pronounced dead at the scene. Dang. So, yeah, apparently Jalen was actually her grandson. Yes. And the children he stabbed were his 12 year old brother, 10 year old sister and 10 year old cousin. <laughs> yeah. Wait a yeah. minute. So it's not Michael's kid. Was it Michael's brother's kid? I don't know. I wasn't. That wasn't like anything that I could find. I couldn't find whose kid he was. Nothing like that. I just saw that it was his grandmother and his two siblings that died. I do know that Michael had two children. That is something that we know. So being that there's three children here, I'm not entirely sure mm-hmm. if it was his kids or not. It could be his brother JR's kids who I have no idea. But either way, one of Michael's kids was hurt because the cousin was there too. So well, even- yeah, that's yeah, that's that's if she only has, you know, two. a certain right, right, right. If that's if he only has two kids. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh mm-hmm. my goodness, isn't that's that not cool. Like, isn't that wild? And he was sentenced to life for those crimes. Why are you stabbing your own brothers and sisters? Like. Some people really just fly off the fucking hinge. Maybe he was abused and didn't know how to. Yeah, maybe, you know, didn't have a good outlet for it. Maybe he thought he was saving his siblings. Mm -hmm. You know, people do have that type of mindset. Good Lord. So, yeah, that's our case this week. 
that's holy pain. cannoli yeah that was and that was an unexpected twist at the end i know right i was not expecting that hold on wow. we have a little more <laughs> So people, it's about Diane. So people close to Diane said that they didn't want her to be remembered only as the mother of a serial killer. One of her co-workers said that Diane was, quote, a loving and kind person. And sometimes I think that gets lost. I just want them to remember her smile and how much laughter and joy she brought to people's lives. End mm. quote. An old high school classmate said, quote, she was just a fine person and I'm a better person to have known her. Oh, wow. It's so crazy how people can have totally different experiences and perceptions of people. Yep. From the pictures and stuff like that, she didn't seem like an evil woman, but who really seems evil? Right. You know? So, Michael either just way, like a lame, but he killed people. Correct. <laughs> correct. He seems like he just wasn't hugged enough and right. that turned into, you know, murderous anger. But mm. either way, Diane, I hope you're resting in peace. Um, I don't know enough about you to condemn you myself. You know, I just wish maybe you were a better mother to your kids, but you still didn't deserve to be stabbed and killed, you know, like that. By your own grandson. By your own fam. So, yeah, now that's our case. <laughs> that is our case for this week, you guys. Wow. Wowzers. Mm -hmm. it's definitely a doozy well thank you guys so much for listening this week um and before we go again one more reminder the merch store is finally active so you can just go to blacktruecrime.com and place you a little order or whatever i have oh, a whatever. lot of shit <laughs> we have a lot of shit on sale right now so just get that before it you know, it's over with and you yeah. get free shipping. So like, what are you talking about? Free shipping is only for the U.S. right now, by the way, but I am working on international shipping being free. So we fuck with you Period. guys. We love you guys. And that's what we got to say. Okay. Oh, okay. So safe. with that, I was going to say, <laughs> with that being said, be safe, protect your peace and protect your space. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye guys. <laughs> I have a right to do that, but you have no right to judge me.